It's always fun to have coaches on this podcast and learn about their story and their journey to this point. And it's even more fun to watch what happens for them afterwards. And that's the case with Scott Power, who now is the defensive coordinator at Louisiana Tech. After a career as a Division III football player at Wisconsin Platteville and Hanover College, Coach had a professional career in Europe in the Arena League, and then he served as the defensive coordinator at Benton Central High School in Oxford, Indiana for two seasons. From there, he made the climb of the ranks of the college levels. From there, he moved to Wartburg College, where he coached linebackers and defensive line. He went on to Marion University in Indiana from 2013 to 2015. He was the defensive coordinator there, named the NAIA Coordinator of the Year by Football Scoop and the Mid-States Football Association Assistant Coach of the Year that same season. He's orchestrated a top 10 defense at every stop along the way, eventually moving that up to the FCS level. So after Marion, the NAIA, he moved on to Central Washington, which is when we met him on this podcast and did our interview with him. After Central Washington, he spent one year at Texas A&M Commerce. Again, he had a top 10 defense there. From there, he moved on to Stephen F. Austin, where he helped that defense move from the bottom of the FCS all the way up to number 15. The 2021 defense at Stephen F. Austin ranked among the best in the Western Athletic Conference and in the nation, helping the Lumberjacks to the NCAA FCS playoffs. Stephen F. Austin ranked number one in the WAC in scoring defense, total defense, takeaway, sacks, and opponent third down conversion. And from there, that's earned him the opportunity now at the FBS level at Louisiana Tech. So we're excited for Coach Power and what he's going to do now at the FBS level. And I'm sure there's much more to come in the story that he is writing for himself. So here's our interview with Scott Power, defensive coordinator at Louisiana Tech. I am joined today by the defensive coordinator at Central Washington University, Scott Power. Coach, it's great to have you here on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for inviting me on. Well, Coach, you've been at, at Central Washington now two years, and you've elevated the defense to one of the tops in the country in both 2016 and 2017, being in the top 25 in several categories. This year, in 2017... Central Washington finished 11-1 in undefeated regular season. You guys were number one in sacks in the country, 61 sacks, 5.08 per game. You're also number one in rushing defense at 44.4 yards per game. And then number three in total defense, number three in third down defense, number four in interceptions, four in tackles for loss, and 19 in scoring defense. You guys really had it going on on the defensive side of the ball in 2017. Yeah, it was a really fun group to coach. It was a fun year for us. You know, this group was highly motivated. You know, this was a a group that had set high goals. They wanted to win a championship. So every day they were motivated, you know, to work hard, practice hard, prepare hard. And so it was a it was a good a really good year for us. Well, coach, we're definitely going to get into uh your your defense here, but um before that, let's talk about you know, your start in coaching. And I think all of us can point back to some some key things that happened to us or were taught to us along the way that really helped us develop as coaches. What is that for you? Yeah, uh, I played Division three football. I played at Hanover College in Southern Indiana. And uh, after my playing career, so then from there, things kind of led where I, you know, I played a year in Europe and spent a couple of years in the Arena League and and I uh, had uh, broke my leg in 2007 and got a chance to coach high school football for two years and got my feet wet that way. And then from there, I got offered a job at Wartburg College in Waverly, Iowa, and uh, was able to join a really successful Division three program and really learned all areas of a successful football program, you know, from uh, when recruiting to the off season weight room to video to you know you name it uh, you kind of have your hands involved in everything and obviously you know football wise kind of how to be a college coach how to how to go about the daily work the administrative side of things and so I learned a lot there and uh, that's probably where where I got my start and kind of what what shaped me the most was some of the things I learned uh, while working there at Warburg. 
Well, Coach, obviously you've, you've brought that to a couple of stops along the way. Prior to coaching at, at Central Washington, you were at Marion, Indiana. Tell us a little bit about uh, your successes there. Yeah, so I left Wartburg after the 2012 season, and we went to Marion University there in Indianapolis. It's actually where you know where I'm from. So heading back that way was very enjoyable. It was fun. And uh, that was also a program that was, it was a different situation where uh, Wartburg had been around for a long time, traditionally, uh, you know, kind of a perennial powerhouse in the Iowa conference and in and, and the West region of the playoffs and was used to competing for, for conference championships and postseason appearances. Whereas Marion had only had football for, you know, I think seven or eight years at the time when I got there. And so you're trying to establish, you know, the program and, and get the program off the ground and kind of build the build it the way that you like it to be done. And so we had, you know, we had recruited some really good players and got them to play hard and saying we got on a pretty good run there. You know, it was a really good group of players, really good group of coaches that we worked with there. And and then, you know, we had the chance to play for the national championship in the NAI in 2014 season, came up a bit short and kind of regrouped and came back in the 2015 season and, and were able to win it. And so a really good run. I think, uh, you know, in the three years that I was there, you know, we played close to 40 games. I think we went, you know, we were like 29 and 10 or something along those lines uh, during those three years. So really good run. And uh, it was a lot of fun to, to work there as well. Coach, obviously, uh, something you, you learn along the way is the importance of, of building a strong culture. And as a defensive coordinator, you have the ability, obviously, to, within the framework of the team, to build the culture in, in your unit as well. What are some of the things that you do to create a successful defensive unit? Absolutely. And I think that's a, I think it's a fine line for a defensive coordinator between you know, making, uh, in terms of how much team is going to be a part of what you're doing as opposed to culture and fundamentals and, and just the, the physicality and the toughness that you're going to play with on the defensive side. I think for us, we want to kind of become or be our identity of what we're about. So we, we do coach it. You know, we coach effort, uh, you know, we coach playing hard before we, you know, coach anything else, really, to be honest with you. And, uh, but yeah, that's from every place, you know, going back to Wartburg College and going to Mary and then coming here to Central Washington. I, I think that's been the number one thing that we've addressed at every, at every stop along the way has been how hard we're going to play, how tough we're going to play, how physical we're going to play. And, uh, and we're trying to find, you know, the 11 toughest, most physical guys that, that we can find to put out there on the field. I know, having talked to, to Coach Shu both on the podcast and, and outside of the podcast, that uh, the teaching side of things are very important at Central Washington. And, you know, you guys do some things, I think, that are, are unique and on the cutting edge. Tell us a little bit about what you do in, in your preparations of your units off the field. Yeah, so we'll teach from every angle. You know, we'll teach, you know, from kids taking notes, you know, t teaching on the chalkboard. Uh, we'll teach using uh, video, and we'll use cut-ups of previous schools, you know, the pressures or the coverages or the stunts that have been ran at, at Marion or Wartburg or here uh, from previous seasons. Uh, we'll use, you know, practice video, you know, from spring practice or fall camp. Uh, we'll use, you know, obviously walkthroughs to teach. Uh, we'll, we'll teach from every possible angle, and we'll use, you know, we, we use PowerPoint. You know, a coach on our staff does a great job with, uh, you know, the animations and the transitions, you know. So when we install a defense with the front and the coverage, we'll, you know, there's, there's built-in slides where the slides are moving and in motion. We'll use everything possible to teach football, you know, to our kids. We want our players to be to be smart players and be very intelligent and, and know exactly what they're what they're seeing and what they're up against every Saturday. With all the angles you teach from, what advantage do you find in being able to to kind of hit all the learning styles that you might have? Yeah, exactly. So I'm I'm the son of a teacher, and so. 
uh, you know, I think you learn early on, right, in uh, in education that some kids, every kids learn differently. You know, some kids learn visually. You know, some kids learn by taking notes. You know, some kids learn by doing. The brain works differently for every kid, and so uh, we try to connect with all the different learning styles in the room. You know, and and make sure that we've addressed it, and then it's and it's clear we spend almost probably equal amount of time in the classroom as we do on the field, you know, in preparing for a practice and preparing for a game. And so we want to make sure we take advantage of, of all that time spent in the classroom and that it's, it's effective, it's efficient time, you know, not just, and not just, you know, time in the room. So, so yeah, we try to, we try to connect with everybody. I know one of the tools that coach Shoemaker mentioned uh, when he was on the podcast that he was excited about and was was purchasing for this season was a drone. Talk to us a little bit about the the view from that angle and how useful it is in practice. Yeah, we love it here. Uh, had the the fortune to we had one back when I was at Marion, so we would have to share it. You know, the offense would get it for a period, then the defense would get it for a period, and and so uh, we really started with it back in I think twenty. 2015 mm-hmm. might have been the first year uh, that I was exposed to one. And then so coming here, we had the, the budget to where we could, uh, to each side can now have one. And so we use it a lot. And it's, I think it's the best view that I've been around, you know, so we, we do carry a handheld, you know, we do have a kid that will be up in the lift for us to get us still, a, you know, a wide and a tight shot in case there's a weather issue, uh, wind, rain, whatever. But here in Ellensburg, honestly, we don't have a lot of weather problems in the fall. So we're all in on the drones. And it's mm-hmm. it's been really a critical part to our operation. He said it's it's our main main view for practice tape. Well, Coach, obviously what you do off the field is, is translating also to what's happening on the field. And, you know, you guys this, this past year – um, let's just focus on sacks first. You guys were able to, to create uh, 61 sacks, an average of 5.08 per game. I mean, that is that has to be a nightmare for the opposing team, knowing you know they're starting to see all those on film when you guys are coming in. How do you how do you guys get that kind of of a performance? Where obviously, to be able to have that kind of average per game, that's a, a high total for anybody at any level. So, what are some of the things you guys are doing to create sacks? Yeah, we, um, it's a testament to our players and, and our coaches and, and the job that, uh, that everybody did this year. So it, it probably starts with our approach. You know, we are an attacking front. We do base out of four down, but we do play three down fronts as well. You know, whether that's in our base personnel packages or sub packages on third down, we do like the offense to have to prepare to protect uh, both four down and three down fronts. But, you know, going back to our base, you know, being an attacking style of play and reading things on the run, being a vertical disruption team, uh, we were able to, to get a number of pressures out of our base defense, you know, and, and being able to, to, you know, sack the quarterback, make quarterback feel uncomfortable with a four-man pass rush. So we were able to do that, you know, and then, you know, we were able to, you know, when it comes to pressuring the quarterback, we try to be calculated. We try to avoid being reckless uh, with our pressure. And, you know, we try to make sure that we're attacking pass protections the right way, uh, whether that's with a four-man or a five-man or a six-man pressure. We try to we try to carry a number of ways into the, each game of how we can best, you know, attack their, their protection and, then, and try to get after the quarterback. Coach, as you're uh, preparing your, your game plan and you take a look at the different ways you want to pressure, you know, is, is there a sweet spot for you? I know guys on the offensive side of the ball talk about, you know, different amount of, of plays they want in their game plan or, or set amount, I should say, um, and keeping it limited. What, what kind of things do you do on defense so that you can, you can teach and execute those things and be successful? We got a handful of pressure concepts that we carry, you know, that we'll teach in fall camp, you know, and we'll carry into each game. You know, we will carry a few specialized pressures. Typically that number is going to be probably two to three, 
that are, you know, just exclusive or just, you know, for that particular opponent, you know, and then we'll carry our, you know, two to three concepts that we taught back in August and, and, you know, we feel like they apply kind of week in and week out. So typically out of our base defense, you know, we're going to be somewhere in that four to six range of ways that we can pressure third down being kind of outside of that, you know, and that's, it depends a little bit too on how many personnel groups, you know, the opponent has. If we're seeing a team that's going to be, you know, exclusively 11 personnel or, or 10 personnel, maybe that number is a little higher. Or if, you know, we're going to see six or seven different personnel groupings and, you know, maybe that number is, is a bit lower. It, it, you know, there's, it, there's a sweet spot in there, I think, in terms of what you can execute well, how your kids can play fast and not bog them down. Mm-hmm. So, and, and what you can, what you can practice, you know, there's right. only, there's only so many reps on a Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday and what you can practice, you know, so uh, we, we try to find that right number as, as we get, and if we need to, we can always pare it down, you know, and, it's one of the, it is one of the strengths, you know, you asked about like year two versus year one, year one, that number might've been a bit smaller, you know, mm-hmm. just by right. kids learning and, and going through that. But as we got into year two, there's some, some recall, you know, from year one and, you know, maybe something that we ran, you know, week three or four of in 2016, we were able to pull out in week nine this year of, you know, and, and we hadn't ran it you know, up to that point. So, you know, I, I think we're always, it's something that we are always aware of every week and, and trying to make sure that we don't, we don't carry too much that we can't execute and we can't play fast and, and we won't be able to, to click it off. At the same time, we face some, some really good offenses uh, in our league this year. And, and if we, if we were too static of a defense, if we were in, in one clear picture for some of these offenses and some of these quarterbacks that we were going to have a hard time versus the Azusa Pacifics and the Humboldt States mm-hmm. and the Texas A&M Commerces. And I know, Coach, obviously a lot of defense it's evolved to trying to make sure you have uh, the right number of guys in the box versus whatever set you might be seeing, and a lot of that's personnel-driven. What do you guys base out of? What do you consider your base defense where you start your teaching from? Yeah, we base out of four down. You know, that's that's kind of been our MO. We do our league here and really probably most of college football now is, is primarily a one back, you know, whether that's an eleven personnel or a or a uh ten personnel operation, you know, it, so we spend majority of our time in a nickel personnel grouping for us. The roots of what we do stem back to a 4-3 defense. We just That third linebacker doesn't see the field a lot for us right now. And this year we were 90% one high, uh, whether that's you know cover three or man free uh, or zone pressure. Uh, we were a 90% one high team. And, uh, and really we've built it philosophically around trying to stop the run and force the opposing quarterback to beat us. And, uh, and then we try to eliminate or limit all the explosive passes, you know, and that's from a philosophical standpoint, what we're trying to do and how we think, you know, or what we think equates to winning football games is stopping the run and eliminating explosive plays, you know, is, is kind of what we're trying to do defensively. And obviously you guys excelled at stopping the run, number one in the country, holding teams to, to 44.4 yards per game. Um, which is obviously you look at, okay, if you're shutting down the run like that, you're probably going to get more opportunities to create sacks because the other team's going to look to throw the ball. Absolutely. For you guys up front, obviously, you know, what are the, some of the things you're looking for in that group to be able to be dynamic enough to play the the spread offenses and the, some of the, the teams that are going to zone read and, and yet at the same time be stout enough to come in and stop the run. Yeah. So we're uh, really philosophically what we are, you know, what we've been is a one gap team, whether, we, you know, regardless of front, we've been a one gap, single gap approach, you know, so we've tried to recruit and personnel our defense, whether that's, you know, adjusting guys from moving guys down or whatever it might be to be a fast defense. And so 
we've recruited to a single gap approach. Now this year we did include some two gap principles in some of our base defenses, but for the most part, we've been a, we've been a single gap team. And so we're trying to recruit and find pass rushers, uh, really, to be honest with you. We think that we can get those guys squared up on how to play the run and how we want, you know, how we want them to fit the run game. So, you know, and I think that's going to allow us, because you know, really we're going to defend the run too with, with numbers, you know, on a lot of those choice downs, a lot of those first and second downs. The numbers, we try to get the numbers in our favor. There's some things that, that we can do playing with maybe a little lighter, faster guy that will cut the front up or, or keep them on the move to try to make it a hard picture for the offense to block. But, but that's, you know, that's kind of how we're trying to personnel it is trying to find guys that we think we can coach and teach to rush the passer, knowing that we can coach the, we can get the run game squared up. Mm-hmm. Now with, with your, your, your back end of the defense, you said playing you know, one high, one safety defense, 90% of the time. Is that something you've typically done in the past, or is, has uh, has there been something that's prompted change to doing that a little bit more? Yeah, no, this is uh, – so if you went back to Wartburg College, when I first started there, we were a one high team. And then um, kind of gradually over – by the time I had left there, we had transitioned – into becoming a, a quarters team, really, and uh, and uh, becoming a two I team, and then that was really my entire time at Marion. You know, we played some one high defense. That was always a part of you know of our defense and a part of our package. But you know, kind of when quarterback run game hit the height there three, four, five years ago, we were we were primarily a quarters operation and then really spent you know kind of the last off season you know at the end of every season you sit back or you go through and analyze where you're at and what it was going to take to win our conference and win our league here some of the things that you did well and some of the things that you thought you could improve on you just really thought that you know to beat Azusa Pacific who won our conference and to beat Humboldt State and beat some of these other offenses we were going to see needed to evolve and we needed to uh, take a good look at what we were doing. So the one high was it was really meant to still, you know, philosophically, I don't think anything changed, you know, with, with still wanting to build it around defending the run and stopping the run. It was more about trying to eliminate uh, or limit the explosive plays. And also, when you look back at my history, you know, historically we've been – really good at taking the ball away from the offense and the one when we got here in 2016 we changed you know we were able to turn a lot of things around the one thing we did do a great job of in 2016 was was taking the ball away from the offense and so that was something that going back and analyzing over the last three four years of okay when we're getting these takeaways how are we getting them where are they coming from and and uh, and so same, you know, that would really the kind of the shift in coverage was was meant to address those two other areas of really our big three goals on defense here are, are we want to hold the opponent to under 100 yards rushing. We want to, you know, limit the explosive plays. You know, we want three plays or less of 25 yards or more. And we want to create two takeaways in the game. You know, that's that's really the three goals that we carry into every game. Those are our big three. And so the shift in coverage was meant to help address those other two areas, you know, address the uh, explosive plays and the takeaways. Obviously, a, a big part of the game now, a lot of focus for offensive teams. And it really doesn't matter what kind of base offense they run. They're finding ways to put the RPO yep. into what they do. How much have you seen of that in the past year? A lot, a lot. And I think that's, I don't know. It seems nationally to me, but for sure, regionally in our league, quarterback run game has decreased a little bit in favor of the RPO. That's the kind of the modern thing right now. It seems to be, you know, we started seeing it probably 2014 was going back to when you started seeing it frequently. You know, 2015, it's higher coming out here in 2016 it was you know probably half of our schedule half of our games were major where rpo is part of almost every play call 
uh, and then this year saying very, very high, you know? So yeah, it's, it's a major thing. I do think, you know, one high defense can allow your perimeter players to play on the perimeter, your box players to play in the box. There's some things there that, uh, that you can take advantage of, but yeah, it's defending RPOs is, is a major, major part of what we do. What's, uh, what, what has been the toughest RPO you've seen to defend, uh, whether it's, you know, they're, they're, they're really doing something different with how they, they key you or uh, where they're throwing the ball. You know, what is, what's presented some challenges in the RPO game? Yeah, well, some of it I still think is based around personnel, you know, and when that, when that wide out is uh, a really good player, the quarterback's a good player, you find yourself in a one-on-one matchup, there is still some, you know, some personnel driven, you know, things there but when you're trying to defend like, okay, how can we get enough numbers to the run game? And if we're still trying, if we think we need to get two guys, you know, to help out on a specific wide out, then, then it can become difficult. I think part of the thing with the two high, the two high teams, is, you know, whether it's a uh, quarters or, you know, you're seeing some of the, you know, the cloud cover two, putting the corners in the fits, you know, is wear that extra hat. Like if you're going to, if you're going to be a too high team, you know, the kind of the modern day thing RPO wise is, is the Y off run game. You know, the T yeah. offenses are trying to get, their, they're trying to get their two back run game out of, you know, a spread look. So if you're going to be in a four, two box and you're going to get an extra hat, whether it's one of your safeties or, you know, your overhang player, uh, how you're going to get that guy into the fit. You know, I think offenses have wisened up a little bit to realize like, okay, there's an extra guy coming. We just have to identify where the extra guy is coming from, you know, whether it's a field overhang nickel or, you know, the three, four teams or the, you know, or if it's the drop down safety. So I think that was one of the, the conflicts or one of the things when you are a two high team, whether your quarters or, uh, structure or whatever it might be of how you're going to get that next guy to the fit or next guy to the box and not have him be the read because if he, you know obviously once the offense identifies where that extra hat's coming from they start reading that guy then then maybe you're getting the ball chucked out someplace where you don't want it right with obviously rpo becoming a, a focus in the game have you done anything in your practice to to work those things differently do you have any types of drills that you like one of the great things that I think, fortunate, I was fortunate this way. At, really at Wartburg, we had this there. We were, I was fortunate at Marion, and fortunate here too is that in spring ball and in fall camp, uh, we get to defend a lot of types of offense, and we get to defend a lot of modern day offense. You know, and so we're able to see, you know, in our crossover periods and our team periods we're able to defend a lot of rpos and and so a lot of times you know whether it's we'll use we'll use segmented periods in fall camp you know whether it's a perimeter drill where we're going to work this the screen fit whether it you know the different types of perimeter screens and so that we can work those with our perimeter players we'll still do the crossover periods with you know the inside drill where we're going to, you know, teach the run fits and, and those things. So we try to segment it, you know, in, in our teaching and, you know, teach the, the core, teach the box fits, teach the perimeter fits. You know, obviously we'll we'll get the routes and, and those things coached up. But, you know, and then when we get to team, we're able to kind of tie it all together. And we do get to, you know, we get to defend those things. We get to see them in spring. We get to see them in fall camp. And Shu does help me out a lot with, you know, in, in fall camp structure and practices of, hey, I, I, I'd like to get a period of this, you know, whether it's Y off, uh, formation of the boundary, motion, you know, you name it, um, able to get looks at things that, you know, we need to get looks at to prepare our defense for, you know, it's hard. Nowadays, I think with our schedule, what we defend I think when you build your defensive package, you have to have a package that's somewhat flexible, you know, mm-hmm. and somewhat versatile. And it, it's got to be adaptable, you know, because like for us, last our first game of the year last year, we were seeing, you know, three and four tight ends, you know, and then you go to the very next opponent in week two and it was empty, 
you know, and so in, in kind of anything in between. So the more, you know, looks at those things, the more teaching that you can do, because really we, we want to coach and teach our defense in spring practice and fall camp. And then once we get into the season, we really want to coach your offense, you know, and, and how we're applying our defense to what you're doing. And uh, so that our kids know when, when, you know, they see different things on Saturdays of, of what it's, what it is, what we're trying to do to it. Obviously, uh, you know, offenses evolve <laughs> and uh, you, you got to have the answers. And um, at certain points, coaches focus on a, a phase of offense that they think is going to, going to give uh, the most problems to a defense. So we've, we've seen that kind of go through, you know, the up tempo to now RPOs. And I, it seems like, teams are getting back into trying to utilize more formations where I think the up-tempo was to cut it down. Now they're looking at how do I get more shifts and motions and those types of things in while remaining an up-tempo offense. Have you guys experienced anything like that yet? And what's your, your opinion, I guess, on what might be the hardest part of, of making sure you know your defense is sound against a certain type of attack? Yeah, I still think the hardest offense to defend is one that's balanced. I think that's the most difficult is offenses that can run and throw it with equal effectiveness. I still think that's you know where, from a defensive standpoint, you're always uh, aware of their ability to do either one. So the tempo, you know, I, I think you know tempo is still a part of college football. And I don't know, you know, I, I remember the first time I remember like 2009, 2010, uh, when we were having a lot of staff meetings, you know, about, okay, how do we want to handle this and how we want to, you know, kind of build our package to be able to play fast if we need to be able to play fast. And, uh, you know, now I think as with most things, the more that you defend it, the more that you do it, you have better you know, answers every year, you know, whether that's one word play calls or, you know, just your hang huddle system, your hang huddle procedure, quickly being able to get in and out of calls. If, uh, you know, the offense is going to pretend to go fast, then look to the sideline, you know, there's, I think, um, you know, you get a better handle on these things, you know, every year that you do it and the more you compete against specific op- opponents and you realize kind of what they're looking for uh, when they do, you know, look to the sideline or, you know, when they go fast, you know, I think, you know, some teams that see, you know, when they go fast, right, their their offense is, they're willing to sacrifice maybe some of the depth of their offense in order just to try to get you misaligned and uncomfortable, you know, mm-hmm. so in, try, in hopes of trying to get you to vanilla up you know, your defense. So, right. you know, it, it's a part of our fall camp, just like uh, some of those other things. That's that's another, you know, we'll spend two or three, you know, periods in fall camp on tempo, you know, and being able to run our defense, like our base calls uh, that we would teach at that time of year, being able to run them, when an offense is going fast. Mm-hmm. And so we'll work that, we'll work that procedure and we'll work that uh, at that time. Well, coach, uh, I, I appreciate you sharing some great ideas with us here today. Question I ask of all the guys as the show ends is looking back at all you do. It doesn't have to just be focused on, on what you're doing on defense, but looking at everything you do, what is it that gives you guys the winning edge? It's a good question. I think I think it's our uh, our players and our staffs, just the work that we're putting in. You know, our players, and not just in season. I think it's our here in the off season. You know, the work that that we're going to put them through. Uh, the summertime, you know, as a coaching staff, obviously, you know, the the preparation that's you know will start here after signing day. You know, as we start gearing up for for spring practice and next season. You know, I, I think that is over the over the years has been, you know, part of the difference and, and hopefully, you know, giving us an edge is just the the work, you know, and mm-hmm. there's no shortcut to it. I don't know if there's a you know, a magic recipe. I think it's um 
you know, I do think that there's something to be the culture, you know, the chemistry, uh, I think is very important. You know, we touched on that, you know, building that, but I think, uh, I think that's, you know, getting guys to buy in, you know, to what you're doing and, uh, and getting those kids to play hard and play fast and physical, you know, practice, mm-hmm. uh, I think is, is really critical, you know, to what you're doing and practicing at a high, high pace, you know, how you want to play on, Saturday afternoons, you know, getting that to show up on, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you know, I think it ties back into that preparation thing. So I think that's, uh, I think that's probably been, you know, maybe been our edge. If you, if you want to, you know, if you're looking for something, it might be the, the preparation side of things of, you know, when you include off season, summertime, and then uh, fall camp, and then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday throughout the week. I think that's, I think that's helped us. Yeah, definitely. Well, coach, how can our listeners connect with you? Probably um, if if they look me up, uh, email, Twitter, you know, any of those uh, electronic modes of <laughs> of communication work well for me. So my email is is on our website there, and then uh, you know you can tw- find me on Twitter as well. What's your Twitter handle, Coach? It is at Coach underscore Power. It was great to have you here on the podcast, Coach. Definitely look forward to see seeing what you guys do in, in uh, 2018. You guys got it uh, rolling over there at Central Washington right now. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Congratulations again to Coach Power and good luck in your new position at Louisiana Tech. Follow me on Twitter at Coach K. Grabowski and follow all we're doing at CoachAndCoordinator.com.